Hello class, Professor Anderson here. Uh, let's take a look at a classic homework problem. Uh, this is one that you guys have been struggling with a little bit. Uh, in this problem, we have the following. In a physics lab experiment, a compressed spring launches a 30 gram metal ball at an angle of 25 degrees. Compressing the spring 19 centimeters causes the ball to hit the floor two meters below the point at which it leaves the spring after traveling five meters horizontally. Okay, so we've got a picture here of the setup. This is our spring-loaded cannon. The uh, pink ball compresses the spring. You start that ball, therefore, at height H1 if you compress the spring at distance S. It then leaves the um, launch tube at a height H2, exiting at V and heading off at an angle theta, and then it follows normal projectile motion. Now the givens in the problem that we just said are the following. The mass of the ball is 30 grams, which is 0.03 kilograms. Theta is 25 degrees. The compression distance of the spring is 19 centimeters. The range that it goes is five meters. And the height H2 that it leaves the spring is two meters. So what they're looking for is K. What's the spring constant? We're also going to probably need H1 for this problem, so I identified it on there, even though we're, we're not exactly sure what H1 is yet. So why don't we think about how we're going to attack uh, this problem? It seems like conservation of energy would be a good approach here. So let's think about conservation of energy. So of course what conservation of energy says is energy initial has to be equal to energy final. And why don't we consider the initial point when it is just in the uh, tube with the compressed spring and we'll consider the final point when it's just leaving the target, uh, leaving the end of the tube. All right, so how do we do this? Well, we've got a bunch of different terms that we can think about in energy. We know that there's a spring here, so we're going to have some uh, spring potential energy initially. We know it's at a height H1, and so we're gonna have some gravitational potential energy initially. And it's not moving when the spring is fully compressed, it's just waiting to launch. And so I think that's all we're gonna need for the initial. On the final side, when it's leaving the um, tube, what do we have? Well, it's moving, so we have kinetic energy. But we also are up at some height H2, and so we're gonna have gravitational potential energy. And I think that's it, right? If we're only considering those two points, uh, initial and final being compressed spring to launch, then I think that's all we need, right? At this point, the spring is completely expanded and you're not worried about it anymore. All right, so let's think about these different terms. Gravitational initial potential energy. What is that? I'm sorry, this is spring initial. Spring initial is of course one half K times S squared, all right? Gravitational is mg, H1, that's the height that we're at. What about the kinetic energy? When it leaves the tube, it's got kinetic energy of one half mv squared. And then we also have gravitational potential energy, so we have mgh2. So let's take a look at this equation and see how many things we know and how many we don't know. So we definitely know uh, S, but we don't know K. That's, of course, what we're looking for. S we know. We know the mass. We know gravity. We're not really sure about H1 yet, but we can probably figure that one out. M we said we know. The speed at which it exits, we don't know that yet. And all these things we know. Mass, gravity, H2, we know. Okay. So we've got one equation now, and we've got three unknowns. So obviously we're gonna need some more equations. So let's take a look at this H1 term first, right? Can we get H1 fairly easily? 
Yeah, I think so. Because if you think about that spring getting compressed a distance s, that's the same angle theta right there as the launch angle, right? The tube is going to be at the exact same angle. And so the little side of this triangle is just going to be s times sine of theta. And now where does that fit into the bigger picture? Well, H2 is all the way to the top of that triangle. H1 is just to the bottom of that triangle. And so now you can see the relationship very clearly between these two. We have to have H2 is equal to H1 plus S sine of theta. Okay. So now we have a second equation. And that second equation, we know H2, we know S, we know theta, and so we can solve that for H1. All right, so let's put some boxes around these equations so far. Got that one, and now we have this one. And I think those are going to help us quite a bit, but we still, of course, have three unknowns with only two equations. So we need one more equation to sort of tie this together. And hopefully, it's going to be this range, right? How does the range come into it? All right, so let's think about that. All right, how do we calculate range, projectile, projectile range? Well, we know when the thing leaves the tube, it's going at V and it's at an angle theta. And therefore there are horizontal and vertical components to that. V cosine theta, V sine theta. And now the kinematic equations apply for this projectile. How do we figure out the distance that it goes. Well, let's draw out the projectile. It's going to go like this, and it's going to come down to the ground. It started its height, h2. It's going to end a distance r away. And now we can use the kinematic equations to solve this. So let's see what we know. We know that x final equals x initial plus vx initial times t plus one half a sub x t squared. Now, does this help us at all? Maybe, let's see. Range r is the final position. The initial position is zero. This is v cosine theta times t. And then we have one half times zero times t squared because there's no acceleration in the x direction, and so we get r equals v cosine theta times t. Okay, what about the y equations? Let's make some room over here and we'll deal with the y equations. So for the y equations, we have the same equation just with y's. y final equals y initial plus vy initial times t plus one half a sub y t squared. We know what y final is, that's zero. y initial is where it started, which is h2. vy initial is going to be v sine theta. Multiply that by t, and then of course a y is negative g, and so we pick up a minus one half g t squared. Okay. And so now we have an equation that looks like that. And let's see if we have enough stuff to solve it. Hmm, we have r. 
we don't know v, we do know theta, we don't know t. Over here, we know h2, we don't know v, we know theta, we don't know t. And of course we know g. So we've got two unknowns here and we have two unknowns here. Are those the same unknowns? Yeah, they are, right? So we can take one of these and plug it into the other one and solve for it. Let's try it. So probably the easiest way to do this is just take this equation right here and let's solve it for t. What do we get for t? t is equal to r divided by v cosine theta. And now let's put that into this equation. So once we put it over into this equation, what are we gonna get? We'll get zero equals h2 plus v sine theta times t, which we said is r over v cosine theta. And then we still have minus one half g times t squared. r over v cosine theta quantity squared. And now we gotta simplify this equation a bit, which doesn't look too bad, right? Zero equals h2 plus the v and the v cancel out. Sine theta over cosine theta becomes tangent theta. So that whole thing becomes r tangent theta. And then we have minus one half g times r squared over v squared cosine squared theta. And now we wanna take this equation and solve it for v, and that's gonna be the last thing that we need. So let's just do it real quick. What do we get? If we move this over to the other side, we get one half g r squared divided by v squared cosine squared theta equals h2 plus r tangent theta. And now we wanna solve this for v. So we need to multiply across by this thing, divide by that thing, and it's gonna get a little ugly, but let's do it. G, I'm gonna need some more room, I think. Let's make some room over here. Okay, so we've got g r squared divided by two, and then we've got to multiply by this quantity that we're gonna divide down there, h2, h2 plus r tangent theta. And all of that is gonna be equal to v squared cosine squared theta. And now we just have to divide down by a cosine squared theta and take the square root. So we get g r squared divided by two cosine squared theta times the quantity h2 plus r tangent theta. And if we take that whole square root, that's gonna equal v, the speed with which it leaves the um, spring-loaded tube. Oof. All right, that looked pretty challenging. So why don't we solve the other equations now and see if we can figure out what k is. Okay, class, we uh, finished this problem off. It took a little while. But uh, this is the velocity that we found uh, in the last little bit. I just sort of rewrote it by pulling out the r squared over cosine squared theta. If you then plug in all your variables, you can calculate what that exit speed is 
for my numbers, we got 5.87 meters per second. So then if we go back to the conservation of energy equations that we had in the beginning, we can take that equation now and solve for K. And you can follow the steps here. Um, the nice thing is when we do H2 minus H1 by rearranging this first equation, that just becomes S sine theta, the spring compression distance times the sine of that angle. So now you get an, uh, an equation for S that looks like this big, ugly mess. And if you plug in all these numbers, you should end up with a K of around 30. All right. Hopefully that's clear. If you need to take a screenshot, I'll step out of frame. Cheers.